Like um, all good Adventist sermons, I want to start with a quote from the Pope. What? Is that odd? It's, it's fine. One should not use freedom of expression to provoke or offend others deliberately, and we should not be surprised when they react. I'll read it one more time. One should not use freedom of expression to provoke or offend others deliberately, and we should not be surprised when they react. Freedom is defined as the power or the right to act or speak you know, how we like. And we live in what we call a free country, a free society. Um, and a lot of the countries we involve ourselves with around the world are also what we call free countries. Free societies with free ideas where the point is you're allowed to walk down the street and theoretically you can have your viewpoint heard by anyone. You can say what you want and still be protected legally for your thoughts. One of the um, you know, best TV shows on TV, obviously, it's got drama and depth. Um, it's, it's fantastic. I actually haven't seen it, to be completely honest, but I was watching some clips this week, and a little while ago, the end of last year, actually, they had a segment on Family Feud which caused a stir across the place. Uh, the reason being, at the time... Grant Denyer, who's, who's the host, the question of the day for the two families competing was, name something people believe is a woman's job. And up came the responses, you know, quick on the buzzers, the two families trying to compete to, to list the things that they would think, the hundred people who were surveyed for Family Feud, how they would have answered. So it's not your answer particularly, it's how you think those hundred people who were surveyed would have answered. And um, anyone like to hazard a guess on what some of those answers were? Be brave. Come on, men, stand up. What do you think? No, nothing. Yes, yeah, so up, up on the screen came all these different responses. There was laundry, dishes, cooking, housework. I'm sitting there going, this seems quite reasonable. They are the things I do. And then I realised it was still the woman they were talking about, not the man. true? No. Okay. They then had the same question posed, but this time, name something that you think a man would do for a job. And obviously, response one, two, three, four were carpentry, builder. So for all those builders in here, you're the real men. Um, and they had uh, mechanic, tradie in general, and all the stereotypical things that we've historically associated with the two different sexes. They had a massive backlash to Channel 10 after that. Massive. I mean, obviously all the other channels picked up on it. I mean, 9 and 7, they just, this is like gold, this is fantastic. They did what? They asked what in this day and age? But the responses were so indicative of how society thought at the time because it came from a random sampling of 100 Australians at the time. If I said to you, let's play Family Feud, and I said, I want to have some words that you think apply to the word freedom, what would some of those words be? I'm I'm looking for answers. You can yell them out. There's nothing wrong. What are some of the words you think of? When I say the word, what is freedom? What's some of the things that instantly spring to mind? First things that pop into your mind? Choice. Choice. Excellent one. What else? What else is freedom to you? What are some things that are free, what, it, what are some things that are free to you? Speech. speech. Freedom of speech. Freedom of choice. What other things? Love. Love. Worship. Worship. All things that are are free to you, that express your freedom you have in this society? Belief. Belief. Lee emails me through the week with a picture. He's like, this would work well for your sermon, wouldn't it? And it's a picture of Freedom Fuels. I'm like, that's got nothing to do with it. Or Freedom Furniture or anything like that. (laughs) 
And some people, when I wrote to some friends and said, what are your thoughts? Because I want to get an idea of what people would say A freedom. The funniest one I had back, and I won't say who wrote it back, um, was nudism. Being nude, having a naturalist lifestyle, was being free. I have promised to Jenny that I will not show any photos, so it's okay. Um, we're going to put the next slide up if we can, if we've got another PowerPoint. Yeah. This is Galatians 5.13, and this is from the Good News. Um, it says, As for you, my friends, you are called to be free, but do not let this freedom become an excuse for letting your physical desires control you. Instead, let love make you serve one another. The next photo I'm going to throw up here is, um, I want to see, anyone know who this man is? Famous Christian, very famous Christian. So this man was the spiritual advisor to Bill Clinton through his impeachment. Whether or not that gives you good street cred or bad street cred, I don't know. But he, he is a very famous Christian. He's written dozens and dozens of books. He appears on TV all the time, obviously not here in Australia. Anyone with his name? Um, I think, I thought I heard it. Tony? Yes? Tony Campalo. He has written so much on so many different things. He is a revered speaker. He's funny, he's witty, sometimes almost to the point of vulgar, to try and get his message across to those who haven't gotten the gospel yet. And he's been so successful at it. The thing is, when he speaks, the world listens. And he loves the freedom of speech that they have, especially in his home country of America. And for him in recent years, his son Bart came to him and said, Dad, we need to have a conversation. I want to exercise my freedom of opinion and let you know that I no longer believe in God. Nothing. Nothing. He said, I just cannot get my head around it. You've taught me your whole life. I just cannot get past this. All of a sudden, freedoms that we have aren't as fun when they start going against things we believe in or want in our lives. So all of a sudden, somebody else's freedom, in this case, in this case his son's freedom to choose what he wants to believe and not believe, really hit him hard. He said it was the hardest conversation he's ever had in his life. Now he goes out publicly and speaking, and just this week, to cause a stir in the Christian community, Tony Campalo, after years of talking against it, on June 8th of this, yeah, this week it was, came out and has decided that he is now pro-gay marriage. He and other very prominent Christian speakers like Rob Bell and others who we've watched so many times in this church before, have made a stand on this particular thing and have decided they don't see there being any biblical reason why they shouldn't support it. This, across especially the, the southern American community of Christians, has obviously caused small waves, small tsunami-sized waves, um, and it is affecting everything over there at the moment. It's only just happened this week. And the story that comes to mind was, um, I was at home one day and I was probably doing the dishes or the, the cooking or the cleaning, and while I was doing it, Em was actually sitting there and I think she was on the couch, she was watching TV, and... <laughs> that's, yeah, that wasn't a joke, that's just how it is. Um... And on the TV was this show that I would never personally watch. You know, it's sort of trashy TV, but, you know, if Em watches it, then I'll support her. And an episode of The Good Wife was on. Um, and they were building a story around a real-life case that only just this last year had finally gotten to the Supreme Court. It had taken years for this case of these two Christian people to make it all the way to the US Supreme Court. And the story, if you've read anything about it, was about Elaine Huguenin. Now, she ran a photography business. 
And in The Good Wife, they started portraying this particular person as somebody who was a very lovely person, upstanding citizen. But then there was one problem that occurred in their life. One day, they got an email, this photographer, and said, we would like you to photograph our wedding. She said, okay, fantastic, love the work, thank you very much. And they said, we're a lesbian couple. And she goes, well, well I, I can't do that. I'm happy to come in and you can come into the studio, I can do portrait photography or, or things like that, but I cannot take photos of your wedding. The emails were released to the court and you can see the, trend, the transcripts of it all. It was actually really quite pleasant and quite nice and everyone was okay, but she was sued for discrimination after refusing to take the wedding photos. And for the last few years, it has gone from court to court to court to court until eventually ending up in the US Supreme Court this last year, where the lawsuit against her was actually found in the affirmative and she lost. She was found to have been discriminating against somebody based on their sexual orientation. And her thought of it all was, where's my freedom? Do I have a say in this as to who I can actually photograph? And look, the arguments of both sides, I'm not here to, to pro or, or, or against anything here. I want to think about freedom and what that actually is to us, the choices we get. Because for her, she felt stripped of her freedom because now she would actually be legally forced to photograph a wedding ceremony that she felt went against her absolute core beliefs. She had nothing against the people in person, but she did not want to produce something that would celebrate this union that she felt was not of God's choosing. And the question then comes, well then, what happens if two people from the occult come to her and say, we would like you to photograph our wedding? Make it a beautiful day. We want to show these photos to all of our friends and show them how great it is to be a witch and a warlock and, and to have a civil matrimony. Or for that tattoo artist that's there and somebody comes in off the street and is a pro-Aryan race and says, I would like you to tattoo a Nazi symbol on my arm. They have the right to ask that because they live in a free country. But with somebody's freedom comes somebody else losing part of theirs. And that person can then no longer say... I don't want to serve you because that goes against my beliefs. And the reason we have that is very, very good because you don't want people being able to open a business and simply say, well, I do not want to serve you today because, well, you're black. Or I don't want to take photographs of you because you're Jewish and you killed my God. These are some of the arguments put across. And in The Good Wife, they took it a step further and actually questioned this woman, this photographer, on the stand and said, how many weddings have you performed from people who have lived together before they were married? And she said, I don't know. How many weddings have you performed of people who were divorced before they ended up remarrying? I don't know. And the lawyers on the show said, well, they're things that Jesus specifically spoke about. They go against your religious belief, and yet you'll photograph them. How can you discriminate against this couple. And to move on with that, you, you may have seen this week too, just a quick little snippet of, it's been an interesting story of um, Nick and Sarah Jensen. Anyone seen it this week? It came out in the news everywhere. Here's a couple who have vowed and declared they will divorce. Christian couple. And they are going to divorce if gay marriage comes through. I'm not picking on gay marriage, which is just a really good topic for freedom of speech at the moment. So they've said, and they went to a paper, and they ended up writing a, a, an article on this, on why they thought that marriage wouldn't mean the same thing to them if other people were allowed to be married as well, against their belief system. And although I may I agree with their ideology on some of these things, it still struck me as very odd that their response to it was to divorce 
which didn't seem to go with the philosophy of Jesus either. The editor who published this article has almost been to the point of being fired now because the backlash that has occurred on such a stupid article written there. And he came back and he wrote another article the day later. And he ended up saying, I don't know why everyone has an issue with me publishing somebody else's point of view. Is this not what freedom is in our society? That two people can have this view, you may not agree, you may not like it, you may think it's stupid, but aren't they entitled to their opinion? And in the same hand, aren't you entitled to yours to think that they're stupid? Where is freedom in our society? We serve a very interesting God because unlike so many other gods that are worshipped around the world historically and even today, our God is very different in, in one major aspect. He let us kill him. He gave us the choice, the freedom to actually say, up yours, God, don't like you, we're going to kill you. And we did. And he would have been killed by any one of us for any single sin. We can't throw it back and say, well, it was the Jews, it was the Pharisees, it was this, it was that. We killed him. And there are not many other gods that I know of in this world who give that much freedom to us as humans. On a... Um, I travel to the US a lot uh, for work, that's what I say, often for golf, uh, sometimes just to get away from the family. Um, you know that's true. Um, and on this trip, it was a few trips ago back to the US, I was standing there, I actually went across to Ohio. Of all things, I, I went to listen to a Michael W. Smith concert. Most of you won't know who he is because you're too young, um, but he, he's a Christian singer. And I went to listen to a concert of his while I was over there this time, and I can remember distinctly that trip, because I walked into Walmart. I love Walmart. I mean, Walmart just has all these really cheap things that no one at home knows they're cheap because they don't have them over here, and they have so much of everything. And in Walmart, it's so great because I can walk in there and I can grab my groceries, my building supplies, my alcohol, my ammunition for my gun. All these different things that are absolutely essential when I go out for groceries. And I went in there, and this particular day, it was interesting. You know, you go, aisle one is, you know, your bread, and aisle two is your cereal. And I got across to aisle seven, and it was shotguns. I thought, well, that's interesting. Let's, let's have a look through here. And here you were, just up. I mean, they were in a locked cabinet, don't get me wrong, but you could just buy them. And I said, so what do I need to actually buy one of these? And they said, well, at the time, this was a few years ago, at the time they said, well, we, we would need to see a passport from you. I went, yeah, I've got one of those. What else would you need to see? Well, nothing for you to buy, but for you to use it, you would have to have a gun licence. But I can buy it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And can I buy ammunition as well? Not at the same time, but if you come back tomorrow, you can. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Good to know. Well, the problem is, one day, <laughs> one day... There was a guy who was sitting in the car park and he was outside a Walmart in Ohio. Well, not the same Walmart I was in, but it was only about four or five kilometres away. And he ended up getting there... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. He ended up getting there and as he got out of his car, he saw a man getting out of his car and as this other man got out of his car, he picked up a, a handgun from the front seat and put it in a holster under his jacket and he walked into the Walmart store. So this guy follows him in and uh, what's his name? It was Michael Foster was his name and Clarence Daniels was the guy who had just put this gun in a holster under his jacket and walked in. Now, Clarence Daniels wasn't a police officer or anything, he was just a, a normal citizen, they both were. And as they got into the store, Michael ended up tackling Clarence to the ground and yelling out, he's got a gun, he's got a gun, he's got a gun. Stripped him of his gun, held him down until the police arrived. 
When the police arrived, they found out that Clarence actually had a concealed firearm licence and was allowed to carry it under his jacket. Actually, he wasn't allowed to expose it. That's illegal. Michael ended up getting arrested and sent to jail for battery of a human. That same night, as I walked back to the plane, I... I travel, and when I travel, I love getting to security lines, and you see everyone, and they're all fumbling about in their bags and trying to work out what to do, and you can pick the different flyers who fly a lot, and, you know, you try and avoid different things. And for those of who have seen um, Up in the Air, a movie that starred George Clooney, um, I often get told by friends I'm very similar to George Clooney. Um, <laughs> no, 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 hey, hear me out, hear me out. It, in the... <laughs> Old and graying, yes. Um, but uh, no, in the way that I love getting up to a particular security line and trying to work out like a shopping centre checkout, what's going to be the quickest? And you're scanning everyone through there and trying to work out, are they going to be a problem? Are they going to hold me up? Are, do they have too many bags? Do they have, what do they have? I want to show you a little clip from this movie. We'll see. We were having some problems with it before. Let's see if we can um, show this with some sound. Asians. You can't be serious. Never get behind people traveling with infants. Never seen a stroller collapse in less than 20 minutes. Old people are worse. Their bodies are littered with hidden metal and they never seem to appreciate how little time they have left on Earth. There you go. Five words randomly selected for additional screening. Asians. They pack light, travel efficiently, and they got a thing for slip-on shoes. God love them. That's racist. I'm like my mother. I stereotype. It's faster. So you're standing there and you're trying to work out who you're going to avoid getting behind in this line. Because you want to get through as quickly as possible. And here I am all smug, I'm like, yeah, I've flown this, this particular route between LA and Brisbane a whole lot of times. I know what I'm doing, I know what I've got in my bags, I sort of have already pre-gotten out my iPad and my laptop, my shoes are already, you know, slightly off, ready to just fling up onto the counter. Everything's ready, I've got nothing in my pockets. Phone's been taken out, all the coins are in a little bag somewhere. I'm like, this is going to be a breeze. And I walk through, my bag goes through, I'm waiting for it. And then he comes over and he says, sir, is this your bag? I went, well, that's never a good sign. <laughs> and you're thinking, well, do you deny it? What, what's in there? What have I forgotten? And he's like, is this your bag? And I said, yes, it is. And I'd forgotten in there a bottle of water that I had just purchased at the airport. And he said, sir, we're going to have to stop you. You can't take that on board of a plane. Would you like to come over here and we'll do a proper screening of you now? Um, and I, I sat on the plane afterwards, you know, because you're standing there and you're going, okay, 750 mil bottle, I've got about four minutes to get through here. Can I down it that quickly? But if I do, I'm going to get onto the thing and then I'll be tucked into my seat with my seatbelt on for like half an hour and I'm going to want to go bad during that time. Scrap it, I'm throwing the water out. I'll throw away the 99 cents. And I sit on the plane and I go, isn't it amazing that in a free society, I'm dangerous taking water through security. But the man going into Walmart with his loaded gun is totally fine. That's the beauty of a free society. Back in 1986, one of the best albums ever got released. It was by an Australian. Anyone know what it was? Whispering Jack. Brilliant. Johnny Farnham. Look, I, I've seen him in concert a few times because every time he keeps telling me it's going to be the last, so I go and see it. Then the next time it's the last, so I go see that just in case it is. And then the next time, I must have seen like seven last concerts of his so far. And, you know, now they're like, well, back by demand. Well, I'm... You always knew there was going to be demand. If you said it's the last, it's the last. Anyway, I digress. Brilliant album. You know, it had all these great songs on it. It, it had... I can't remember. No. <laughs> Touch of Paradise. And it had You're the Voice. And so many of these other massive singles. Instantly, this particular album won 
every aria he could win that year. Album, male, contemporary artist, song of the year, you name it, all won straight away from it. The very next year, in 19... No, three years later, he ended up becoming Australian of the Year. The problem was he wasn't actually Australian. So just before the actual ceremony, they had to do a quick little um, fix that and naturalise him very, very quickly um, so that he could actually take the award. But it was a couple of years later that he brought out one of the other albums, which was Chain Reaction. And on that, there's a song that, as soon as I started thinking about this sermon, it just kept going through my head. Even last night... That's all I'm playing in my head. I'm like, it's Friday night and I'm playing a John Farnham song in my head. This is not right. I'm trying to write a sermon. And the song was That's Freedom. And in it, it was actually really, really good. He says in it, it's a song about not shoving your plan on anybody else. The light in the dark, you've got the love to share and not to chain. That's freedom. For him in writing the song, it was all about knowing what you want in life, but not imposing it on somebody else. In this case, his partner. But still loving them without chaining them, wanting them, wanting them close, wanting them badly, without actually suffocating them around. And for him, it all came down to free choice. Letting that other person be able to choose exactly what they wanted from life. You may have seen, well, sorry, you may have seen recently on another excellent TV show. Look, I honestly don't watch all these shows, but sometimes. Um, And A Current Affair, you know, brilliant show again. Uh, A Current Affair ended up having, can we move on to, let's move on to that, yeah. Current Affair ended up having on this guy, Travers. Anyone know of him, the Candyman? I've spoken about him at Sabbath school before. Well, somehow, without me even knowing it, he was a client of mine. Um, I ended up taking a job to install some speakers for a pool and ended up installing a massive pool, million dollar pool that was just installed this last year in there and went down there, got to meet him a few times, had no idea where he'd gotten his money from, what he did or anything like that. It was just a massive pool. They'd flown in Italian stone cutters and gold-covered tiles throughout the pool. Uh, His logo of the candy mansion, just everywhere. So I put in all these speakers and it was only, I don't know, sometime in the last few weeks that I saw on a current affair, I had some people call me up and go, hey, isn't that the guy you worked for? Isn't that the pool you were working on? Who is he? What's going on? If any of you saw A Current Affair, he, he lives a very... Well, he wouldn't be classified as a good Adventist if he was an Adventist. <laughs> um, I'm not judging where he's at in life, but in terms of fruits of the Spirit, the fruits are probably a little bit off for what we want you know, in, um, in our lives. And... I probably should have noticed this when on the very last day of construction he offered to get lunch for everybody who'd been working there Um, and and lunch came uh, (laughs) lunch was delivered by uh, some people who had forgotten their clothes. So we tried reminding them, look, you you don't have clothes on, you should probably go and put some on. And that was his lifestyle. I instantly called my wife, probably just to cover myself in case I was on TV. I'm like, I'm not doing it, I'm walking out, it's okay. But this was a lifestyle that he's chosen, like Hugh Hefner in the Playboy Mansion. That is exactly what he's built his, his life around. The reason being, and where he's gotten his money from, is his mum and dad started free choice tobacco. You see them everywhere. The interesting thing is, in articles that he's had interviews on before, he said his parents thought at the time free choice as a name for their tobacco was the most perfect name for tobacco ever. Because they felt regulation and governments and other people were trying to stop grown adults from being able to go home and easily have a cigarette. Now, we all know they're bad for you. Everyone in the world knows they're bad for you. Does it stop people from smoking? No. He's making a fortune, an absolute fortune. 
You walk into, his, into the front of his house, into the side of his house, and he has a Ferrari, a Lamborghini, a Rolls Royce, a Continental GT, a Hummer, Land Rover. He loves cars. He comes to all of his parties via a helicopter. He's got money to burn. And he advertises free choice everywhere in his house because he can't advertise it anywhere else. And there's a massive legal dispute at the moment as whether or not this even contravenes advertising laws in Australia for tobacco. And he's like, it's my own house. I can put whatever sign I want to up on the wall. He said it in a much more eloquent way than what I just did. Um, But this is the grotto. I put some speakers inside that room before there was water in there, obviously, and before it was tiled. When I went back to actually see what it was like, everything around this pool has Vatican pool written on it. And across the grotto there, which is a room filled with water that you can go into and has a couple of beds for sleeping on, um, you go in there and across the top of it is free choice and there's a devil and an angel sitting above the entrance into the grotto. And so many people were saying that is so wrong and it's so this and so that. And in my head... I would see Jesus, my God, look at that and, you, and go, you know what? I did a good job. And be sincere. This is the free choice I wanted for humans. When he was in heaven, Lucifer even had that choice. And what did Lucifer do? He skedaddled with a bunch of angels and came back down to earth. Then the very next story we see in the Bible is that of Adam and Eve, the start of all of this pain for us, where again, God didn't even discourage choice. He encouraged it by putting the tree of knowledge of good and evil bang smack in the middle, put the most delicious looking fruit you could possibly imagine on it, fruit that even I would probably eat, and then said, choose what you want to do. It is up to you. That is the God I am. I'm not going to force you to follow me. I am going to give you free choice in everything in your lives. What are you going to do with it? Eve answered. Adam answered. We can look back with hindsight and say, probably not the best answer, guys, from where we're at today. But if they hadn't have answered wrong, God was going to keep giving us all free choice till kingdom come. And at some point, somebody was likely to take that free choice, like Lucifer, and say, I want something different. So many of my friends who aren't Christians believe that God takes away our free choice. And it's the biggest misconception that I'm trying to get through their heads. God, for me, invented free choice. He is the epitome of of free choice. And when I follow him, I'm not locked into anything. At every turn, I get a choice. Why can't they see this? Last story I'm gonna gonna do today before wrapping up. Can we do the next slide, Joe, if we get a chance? What's this, anyone know? Massive news five months ago, January. in France and inside a publisher's house. Charlie Hebdo, the the magazine, often has very, I guess, divisive, divisive uh, cartoons on the cover. And in this particular one, one of the ones that really upset groups of people is the Prophet Muhammad sitting on the front and it's captioned, a hundred lashes if you don't die laughing. They put out so many of the Prophet Muhammad over since 2011 to 2015. (coughs) Excuse me. There was a massive backlash in the Muslim community. And some would say rightfully so for, I guess, degrading the, the greatness of their spiritual leader. Others were saying, well, this is the beauty of it. France only in the last hundred years brought in separation of state and church so that we could 
say what we want about other people's religions, but it also gives them the right to say what they want about their religion. And on that day, two gunmen walked in and ended up killing 11 staff members inside that day for drawing these cartoons. And then another police officer on the way out. And when they were doing it, the comment that was heard by many people who actually survived the incident was this is retribution for disfaming our God. Translated words. They took what we've to believe to be free speech and felt like they didn't have any freedom in that anymore. And I look at it and go, how do we act? Because Charlie Hebdo had done many other covers against Christians and some of our odd beliefs and the fact that we believe in something we can't see and can't touch and can't deal with. And I would hope that we as Christians look at it and go, you know what? Our God is big enough that this doesn't matter to him. This is the choice he gave them. Heritage Singers had a song, and I know we played them last week. The Heritage Singers had a song that I grew up listening to. And it was based on Joshua 24, 15, which is probably, for me, it is my favourite verse in the Bible. And their song paraphrases it and says, Choose you this day, tell me who you will serve. Let nothing stand in your way, give the praise he deserves. For as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What are we going to do with our freedom? We have it. We have it in this country. We are blessed. As Lee said before, because we're, we're born here or for whatever reason we've moved here, we have freedom being here. We have freedom to say what we want, do what we want in so many different things. What are we going to do with the freedom God gave to us? And for me, that is absolutely it in a nutshell. You've got to choose today who you are going to serve. That is the freedom we've been given, that power of choice. When God gave us that power of choice, he very well knew what we could and would do with it. And still, he gave it. Because without that power of choice, without actually choosing to follow him, we would never know the love that we do for him. There's no way we would know that love if you are forced to love him. But instead he said, here I am, here's the consequences of loving me, here are the consequences of not loving me. And in the lesson today, I know we were talking about the kingdom of God and how easy is it to get into that kingdom? How easy is it to get kicked out of that kingdom? It's the easiest club in the world to enter. You've just got to want it. You've got to accept that gift. And it's the hardest club in the world to get kicked out of because he will continue fighting to keep you in that club forever and ever. He wants you there more than anything else in the world. So with your free choice, my question today is who will you serve?